We are working through the book of 1 Peter, right? Are you guys ready for more challenging words from the Apostle Peter? He has been messing with us, hasn't he? All right, so he's going to mess with us some more today. Um, we're all the way up to chapter 4. We're going to go uh, verses 1 through 11 in chapter 4. Uh, I got a little bit less ambitious because I wasn't sure how long Chris would talk. So, uh, but I also, there's some things here I want to develop. So I just want to take my time and make sure we do that. And uh, there's something cool I want to develop starting in verse 12 too. So I had to push it to the next part because I just want to make sure I have time to have fun with it. Okay. So uh, verses 1 through 11, 1 Peter chapter 4. You have your notes. You can follow along. Uh, you can just wing it. Um, what I want to do today, I think I'm just going to go, rather than read the whole thing and come back, I'm just going to go one verse at a time, okay? And, and remember, if you can, um, some of the things we were talking about in chapter 3, uh, we're going to continue to expound on those. I'm going to, I'll remind you of a couple of them specifically. And all the stuff we've already learned, Peter keeps building on. So uh, if you haven't heard the previous ones, it might be good to go back and hear them. All right, so verse 1, and there's actually a bunch here. Peter says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, which is a really interesting statement. Who here has ceased from sin? No one? Yeah, me neither. But... Uh, it's an intriguing concept and goal, isn't it? So we want to understand what's going on there. Um, apparently, we haven't suffered in the flesh quite enough yet, but we're getting better. Anyway, uh, whenever it starts with therefore, it means all the things that came before. So what, what he's doing is he's building on the concepts that we've been seeing in chapters 1 through 3, okay? So therefore, since Christ suffered for us, so he's He's starting by putting into our minds the example of Christ's suffering. And he says two things about Christ's suffering. First, that he suffered in the flesh, which is pretty obvious. And second, that he did it for others. Remember, he didn't suffer for himself. He didn't need a Savior. He was perfect. He suffered for others. He totally did it for us. It did nothing for him, right? And so uh, that's the example that he wants us to set before us now, the example of Christ's suffering in his flesh for others. And we're going to see how that uh, bears on this. And he says, arm yourselves with the same mind. Now, uh, what he means there is the same mindset. And what I love in a few of these, I'm going to kind of lean on a little bit of what the Greek says. Most of the time, it just says what the translation says, but sometimes there's a little bit of nuance. And this is one of those times where uh, when it says same mind, it means the same moral intention. And I want to underline that word intention. See, what happens a lot of times is I think we, uh, we know Jesus and we uh, just kind of go through life reacting and thinking, well, when things happen to me, I'll pray and try and figure out what Jesus wants me to do. And what Peter's saying here is, no, 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 don't just react. Don't just wing it. He's saying, go into life with the moral intention of Christ, specifically suffering for others. Go into Christ with a, with a moral intention that you're going to suffer for others. You're going to spend yourself for others. That you're going to allow suffering to come into your life to benefit others. See, you, you see the difference. So there's a moral intention there that we, we arm ourselves with that. And it literally means... Uh, when it says arm yourselves, it, it, the Greek means to pick up a weapon, or it means a, a tool or an implement, but in this case, uh, also weapon. So uh, Peter's saying, pick up this mindset of Christ, being willing to suffer in the flesh for others as a weapon. Arm yourself with this in the morning before you go out. Don't just react. Have this intentional mindset that I'm armed with the weapon of being willing to suffer for others. Does that make sense? Okay, now, that sounds a little vague and a little difficult, and, and uh, it's not really something I want to pursue. I don't want to get up in the morning and go look for a way to suffer. 
But thankfully, uh, the world will cooperate with you and provide that. So uh, let's talk about how it works. What I'm finding is uh, there's a lot of things I'm seeing in Peter that uh, I knew I was supposed to do them. I knew I was supposed to love people and, you know, because the Bible says these things. But I didn't fully get why. And what, I'm getting the why more and more as we're going into this. And so we'll get some of the why today. One of the reasons we embrace suffering as a weapon is because it frees others. And I really want to develop this. Now, a couple of these things we've already talked about. So we embrace suffering as a weapon, as a moral intention. I'm going into this. I, I, I'm getting up in the morning and I'm putting on this weapon of I'm willing to suffer for others because I know I can use this weapon to free them, right? And here's where we saw that. Remember in Matthew chapter 5, where it says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, do good to those who, uh, who are evil, uh, all those things, right? Pray for, bless, do good, so that you will be like your Father in heaven. Remember, we already talked about this. And so the first thing we do, we use it as a weapon to represent the Father's heart. So we are armed with this weapon of the mindset of Christ so that when we go out in the world and we're persecuted and we do good and we bless and all that, we're just poking them with that weapon, the mindset of Christ. And it represents the Father's heart. And so they are getting a revelation, hopefully, of Jesus in the way we're responding to their persecution, right? And we saw that just in the last chapter. In 1 Peter chapter 3, we saw that persecution actually creates an opportunity for the gospel. Remember uh, 1 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16, it says specifically, when you are persecuted, first sanctify Jesus in your heart. We could say, uh, adopt this moral intention, adopt this mindset of Christ in your heart, then be ready to give an uh, an account or give an answer to the hope that is in you. For they're going to revile you and speak evil of you. But when you respond with good, they're going to ask. They're going to be surprised and they're going to ask why you're acting this way. Remember that? Remember we covered that? We've, we've hit that about three times now. I'm going to hit that a lot because Peter keeps hitting that. And so we embrace suffering as a weapon to free others because when we suffer for doing good, for, for adopting the mindset of Christ, for being willing to suffer instead of responding and reviling and, and striking back. When we do that, we represent the Father's heart so they get a glimpse of what the Father looks like. A lot of people don't know how loving the Father is. And it might blow their minds to see you act that loving. Amen. Right? And they, uh, they ask, and you get an opportunity for a gospel to uh, explain the hope that is in you. Now, I want to do one other thing here. I, I, a verse came to mind, and I got to thinking about it, and I've had thoughts. I'm going to share these thoughts with you. You don't have to agree with my thoughts. It's okay. But, the, but I'm going to, I, I get to say them, right? So here's my thoughts. Now, this is Peter, of course, writing. And uh, we've frequently, as we've been going through this, gone back and looked at some other things Peter did. There was one time uh, in Matthew 16, where Peter hits a home run and then, and then strikes out later in the chapter. Um, but the home run, which I want to look at, is Jesus says, hey guys, uh, who's everybody I think I am? And they name a bunch of stuff. And he goes, who do you guys think I are? And, and I are. Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> who do you guys think I am? And the apostles all look at each other, and Peter uh, you know, I think at this point they all just look at Peter because he's the one that's going to talk anyway. So uh, Peter goes, well, you're, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And remember the God's answer. It's very important. Uh, Jesus says, you're right. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And he says, this, uh, on this uh, rock, I will build my church. What's the rock? The revelation that Jesus is the Christ, Right? So on the revelation of Jesus is the Christ, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Will not prevail against what? The revelation that Jesus is the Christ. Right? 
On this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church that is walking in the revelation of Jesus. And then he goes on. Uh, this is all in, did we put it up? Yeah, okay, you got it here. This is all in uh, Matthew chapter 16. He goes on, and he says, actually, let me just go to that. He says, uh, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, here comes my thoughts. I think sometimes we have applied this verse on the absolute minimum level of understanding. Um, as it, uh, just saying the words is enough. I bind and I loose. And uh, what I don't see, I've looked through the book of Acts where you see a lot of Peter doing stuff and you see the apostles doing stuff. Nowhere in the book of Acts do I see them holding up a set of keys and going, I bind this and I loose that. I just don't see it. Do you? And sometimes we read this stuff and we get it on such a surface level. Now, I'm not saying we don't ever say, I bind this or I lose that. I'm saying I think it's a lot more than that. These are my thoughts. Je uh, Jesus said, hey, on this confession that, whoops, stay, I am the Christ, on this revelation of Jesus, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell cannot stand against this revelation. And then he says, I'm going to give you keys, more than one key, keys, and uh, these keys are going to bind and loose. I think this is a key. I think Peter is pulling out one of his keys in this passage. I think Peter is saying the mindset of Jesus being willing to suffer to reveal Jesus is a key. It binds and it looses. So you come against me and start reviling me and persecuting me and I respond with the mindset of Jesus, and somehow the uh, gates of hell that are in you cannot prevail against the kingdom of God that is being manifest from me. Amen. Does this make sense? These are my thoughts. That Peter's actually giving us one of those keys to the kingdom. That binding and loosing is a lot more than just saying the words. That when we do this, when we, when we arm ourselves with this mindset that we're willing to suffer for others, that it somehow binds and looses, that it creates a scenario where people are getting set free. I don't think this is the only key. I think worship might be a key. I think repentance might be a key, thankfulness, uh, all forgiveness. Uh, I don't know how big your keychain is, but you know, get all the keys you can get on there, right? These things bind and loose. The, the, what we're after is getting people free from the gates of hell in their hearts that keep them from the revelation of Jesus, right? And so we're manifesting the revelation of Jesus, the key, the, the rock that uh, the gates of hell cannot prevail against. So if someone is coming against you because the gates of hell have them bound, and you begin to manifest the revelation of Jesus in their midst, you might just break down those gates. They might just not be able to stand against that. Does that make sense? It, yeah? No? Yes? Maybe? Okay. Anyway, those are my thoughts. And so uh, I think it's deeper than that. I think this stuff is, is huge. I think uh, Peter is sharing with us a significant key for manifesting the kingdom here. Okay, the other thing... The other uh, way we use this as a weapon, we embrace suffering as a weapon to free ourselves from sin, all right? To free ourselves from sin. Uh, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, I'm going to develop this a little bit more as we go on, but we already did talk about this, I don't know if you remember, in 1 Peter chapter 1, where we talked about refining and uh, being, being refined through fire. And that the, the purpose of suffering is the refining of our heart. Uh, that uh, God is more concerned, uh, he is concerned with our comfort. He is the comforter. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. But he is more concerned with your heart being conformed to Christ than with your comfort, believe it or not. 
And so we learned in chapter 1 that he will use suffering, he will use difficulties to refine our hearts. And so uh, there's this link we see again in this passage. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That suffering somehow brings us closer to the heart of Christ and sets us free from sin. Now, uh, I think one of the things it does is it causes us to rely on him, which is what he's after. He's after complete reliance on him. There's two significant ways we're to rely on him. The first one is we're to rely on him to defend us. We are not to defend ourselves. That's what happens when someone comes against us. And we want to justify ourselves, right? And God goes, no, 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 no. Just be quiet. Remember, I defend you. You don't defend you, right? And the other is uh, he wants to empower us. We don't do things in our own power. We do things in his power, right? Now, as I was tempted to develop these, but uh, next week, uh, John Moss is going to be speaking, and he told me uh, a little bit about what he's talking about. I think he's going to go here, so I'm just going to leave it alone, let John have fun with it next week. So more on uh, that or something like that. Anyway, I did this this summer, and so I just wanted to do this again to remind you guys uh, from... Psalm 119, just to to see this progression. Uh, David went through this. David had an interesting life, right? And uh, in that, he was occasionally afflicted. He was chased around for several years by the king and his army. That's pretty good affliction right there. Then he he fled to uh, the Philistines, and he had to act crazy so they wouldn't kill him. So just David had a lot of this stuff going on. And At the end of the day, he seemed to think it worked out for good for him. Listen to this, Psalm 119, there's a progression here. Verse 67, he says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You know, God, I I noticed that before I suffered affliction, I did a lot of stupid stuff. But now I keep your word. Somehow the affliction has caused me uh, to press into you and do things better. And then skip down to verse 71. In fact, it's good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. God, I've come to the place where I believe all that affliction was good for me. Now, here's a radical leap. Are you ready for this one? A few verses later, verse 75. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Whoa. God, I've, I so... I'm enjoying the man you've made me through affliction. I've come to realize you did this, God. You set this up, and it was your faithfulness. It was your love for me. Wow. There's a mindset that we could possibly use more of. Amen? And so uh, suffering is one of the ways. It's a weapon that we use against our flesh to refine us. Amen? All right. Lots of hallelujahs there. Everybody's excited about that. I understand. Let's get on to verse 2. There was a lot in verse 1. Verse 2, that he no longer, he being us, uh, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. And so he makes this simple contrast. The flesh, uh, which is subject to the lusts of men. Notice, and we're going to see it in the next verse, he's not just saying, Uh, your lusts, the lusts of men in general. So there's a little bit more to this. And uh, he contrasts that with doing the will of God, being led by the Spirit, right? And so we see the classic war, flesh versus spirit, that there's a a flesh and there's a spirit, and uh, they're at war. Now, this is very simple, but it's very important that we get this. In Galatians 5, 16 and 17, it says... um, uh, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It does not say, try real hard not to fulfill the lust of the flesh, and God will let you walk in the Spirit. It says, you can't not fulfill the lust of the flesh unless you walk in the Spirit. Right? So the emphasis is not on refining yourself. The emphasis is on pursuing the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then it tells us why. It says, for the Spirit... Wars against the flesh, and the flesh against the spirit, and they are contrary to one another, and that's why you don't do the things you want to do. That's what it says. It says they're contrary to one another. They war against one another. There's a war. 
You have to understand there's a war because if you don't understand that, you will think there's room for compromise. Well, I can have mostly spirit and a little bit of flesh, can't I? Well, they're at war. That's kind of like saying, well, I can mostly keep my enemy out of the camp and let him have just this one area of the camp, right? Well, I'm not sure your enemy's going to just sit there and not take advantage of that, is he? It's a war. No compromise. They war against each other, and so they will not compromise with each other. And so this is what that means. One must always suffer. One must always suffer. We were just talking about suffering in the flesh, right? What causes us to suffer in the flesh? Choosing to walk in the Spirit. If I choose to walk in the Spirit, my flesh is going to suffer because my flesh doesn't like that. If I choose to indulge my flesh, my spirit man is going to suffer because that nourishment is going to my flesh, not my spirit. Do you understand? So one's always going to suffer. There is no compromise. It's a war. And we need to understand what he's saying here is that we should no longer live in the flesh, but, do, but live for doing the will of God. In other words, we should pick a side. Um, and we need to understand that uh, it's a choice that we make and that suffering in the flesh is linked to resisting sin. So saw that in verse 1. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. I don't think it's saying, obviously, if, you know, you suffer once for Jesus, you'll never sin again. We've all proven that's not true, right? It's saying that if you aggressively pursue uh, not sinning, you're going to suffer in the flesh. They're going to be linked together. Your flesh is going to resist that. The world is going to resist that. You're going to have to continually choose the spirit over your flesh. That uh, you can't just, uh, you can't be righteous and not suffer. You can't be, uh, you can't walk in the spirit and not suffer because there's a war. That's all it's saying. So if you choose, and it is a choice, to pursue walking in the spirit, you're also choosing suffering in the flesh. In the same way, if you choose to compromise in the flesh, you're choosing to do violence against the spirit. Right? So that's all he's saying. So, Suffering in the flesh is linked to resisting sin. And then he goes on in verse 3 and says, For we have spent enough time in our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. It basically sounds like fraternity life, right? <laughs> I got saved just after college. So, anyway. Um, he says, we spent enough time in this, right? Now, I want to underline the world enough, uh, uh, the word enough, because, uh, again, it's that moral intention. We make a decision. All right, uh, I can't keep compromising. I've spent enough time with that, right? And so we have to call enough at some point. It doesn't mean we won't have struggles. It means we make a decision enough. Now, Here's what I mean, because it's not just saying um, we've spent enough time struggling against our own lusts of the flesh, because we all have that. We all have fears or passions or whatever that we have to struggle against, right? It's saying uh, doing the will of the Gentiles, doing the will of the world. It's saying uh, we've done enough complying with the worldly culture. It's not just that I'm tempted to these things. It's that I'm tempted to be these things because the culture around me is doing it and I want to fit in or I want to, I want to be accepted, right? And so he's saying enough compliance with the worldly culture, with doing the will of the Gentiles, with succumbing to the need in me to be accepted by uh, the world or the need in me uh, to uh, come under peer pressure in some way. So it's more than just resisting my own lusts in the flesh. It's a resisting of the pull of the world, of the culture. And there are many subtle ways today. You can, I'm not going to list them. Easy for you to think of them. The way the culture is pulling us to compromise with the flesh, aren't there? Yeah. And so we have to say enough. 
I'm not compromising with the flesh just to fit into this culture. Now, it doesn't mean we intentionally become anti-culture, that we become, you know, annoying, because uh, some churches have chosen that route. All right, let's just be as offensive to the culture as we can be. I don't think that's the deal. It's just saying we're not going along. We're not going along. Okay? So, it's an intentional decision to break with the culture that we're in to, uh, to conform to the culture of heaven. And understand, again, when we make that intentional decision, we are embracing suffering, right? Because as soon as we make it, there's a war between the flesh and spirit. And the people that have chosen the other side are going to persecute us, right? You guys seen any of that? It's really easy to preach this this year because uh, there's so many examples. I don't even have to list them. You got, they just all pop to mind, right? So an intentional decision. Now, he goes on kind of in this vein. Remember, uh, he's saying to resist the pull to comply with the worldly culture. And then he goes on in verse 4. He says, uh, in regard to these things, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. And the, the word there, think it's strange, in the Greek uh, carries the connotation of surprise. They're surprised. I don't under, I'm surprised. I thought everyone felt this way. Why are you not running with us? You guys experiencing any of that? All right. So they are surprised that we don't run with them. And they call it evil, not just different, not just foolish, evil, and they persecute us, right? Not even necessarily because we name Christ, just because we won't run with them, because we won't comply. And so it says uh, they're surprised, and they won't run with us, and they call us evil. Now, I want you to understand why the world calls it evil for us to run in a different direction. And uh, really, in the short answer is lawlessness. Um, the, the Bible refers to Satan as the lawless one. It talks about how the, the lawless one is already at work in the earth. Um, talks about lawlessness in the last days, causing the love of many to grow cold. All these things about lawlessness, right? Now, are you guys noticing any trend towards lawlessness anywhere in contemporary society? Anyone? Yeah. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Uh, lawlessness is the goal of the enemy who, under whom the whole world is sway. The whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. Not us. We have got out. But they're under the sway of the wicked one. Lawlessness, right? Now, I want you to see this. Psalm 2, I believe, is so relevant always throughout history, but so relevant now. The first three verses explain so much about what's going on. Psalm 2 starts with, the nations rage. Not the nations have a different opinion. The nations are mildly upset. They vote differently. Whatever. The nations rage. They're furious. Why are they furious? It says the nations rage and um, they set themselves against who? Against God and His anointed. The Father and Jesus. The nations rage they set themselves, they come together, and they say, we are going to unify over this one thing, the resistance of God. We're going to unify in our resistance to God. Why? Verse 3, we want to cast off his bonds and his constraints. We're really furious. We're coming together over this one thing. We have got to get out from under the constraints of God. We have to have lawlessness, right? No constraints, no constraints. And so no constraints means no compromise, right? Let me find where I'm at, right. So any constraint is evil. That's why in, for example, the abortion debate, you know, uh, well, how about if we don't, if we let you have abortions 
all but the last 10 seconds. No, it's not enough. That's a constraint. That is evil. You are not going to tell us we can't have abortions whenever we want, as often as we want. You understand? You can't compromise with no constraint. And so we have all these people working for compromise. And Israel's a good chance. Can we find peace in the Middle East? Can we have compromise? Uh, well, uh, I don't know if you know this, but in, in the way of, in history, uh, bef before the 30s, before World War II and the persecution of Jews and all that, um, there was a, a deal on the table where Israel would have only had 5% of the land they have now. 5%. That was too much. The Arabs around them said, no, that is too much land for Israel. 5% of the, you know, no, none. We want to push them into the sea. No compromise. There is no compromise. Because I will not accept any restraint. I will do what I want to do, and I'm not having anybody tell me different. That's what we're up against. The spirit of lawlessness. That's why there's no compromise. And so, we see in verse 4, they're surprised that we don't run with them, and they call it evil, because we're trying to take away their freedom. You evil Christians, take away our freedom to do what we want to do. Right? That's... That's the scenario that's being painted. Well, let's see how God handles that. All right. In, oh, I had one more thing I did want to say. Here's one of the ways God handles it. Um, just to remind you, we already talked about 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Remember, they revile us, they persecute us, but we demonstrate mercy and love and forgiveness and goodness and bless them. And it causes them to ask about the hope that is in us. Remember that? So another way of putting that is, we, uh, they're surprised that we won't run with them. But they're also, some of them will be surprised that we willingly constrain ourselves, even though they're not constraining themselves. And they'll ask why. Here's what I mean by that. I'm, they're coming at you and they're furious and they're furious and they're furious and they're furious. And they expect you to respond that way and you love them. And they go, I know you want to yell at me. Why aren't you yelling at me? Why are you constraining the valid emotion of arguing with me? Why? And we have an opportunity to give an account for the hope that is in us. Or uh, we have a different position on some social freedom. And they're coming against us, and they're coming against us, and they're coming against us. But somewhere inside of them, they know that they're not really free, they're bound to this thing, and they can't choose to not do it. And it bugs them that you can choose to not do it. Good. That you can willingly constrain yourself. How are you doing that? And you have an opportunity to give an account for the hope that is in you. Right? So, I think that's how some of this works. So, they're surprised we don't run with them. And they think we're evil because, like in Psalm 2, we would constrain their freedom and so what happens in verse 5 he goes on he says they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead they're not going to get away with it and so again this isn't a ha 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 you'll get yours right i think we covered that pretty thoroughly last week right what he's saying is don't envy their freedom don't envy their freedom or their so-called freedom don't envy that they can get away with stuff you can't get away with because they're going to have to give an account. Everybody has to give an account. It's an important thing that we understand free will. It's amazing. Guys, it is amazing that the God of the universe, who is righteous and holy, created man and gave us ridiculous free will. You right now can leave this place and choose to be as good or as evil as you want to be, and God will let you. He will let you. You get to choose. He has given us all the freedom to choose. The one caveat is we will all have to give an account of him, to him for our choices in that day, right? But understand, he's given us tremendous freedom to make these choices. He's given the world tremendous freedom. Why is evil in the world? Because God said we could be evil if we want to. He gave us choice. Because, this is a whole other sermon, 
He wants voluntary love. He wants us to choose to love him and not be forced to. So he gives us all possible choices to choose from, hoping that we will choose to love him. Oh, well, another sermon. Anyway, he says, don't envy their freedom. Their free will comes with accountability, just like yours. In fact, Christians, uh, we even have more accountability because we've been freed from corruption. Remember in, in 1 Peter 1, verse 23, we read about how we've been born again from incorruptible seed. The whole earth suffers under corruption, under sin nature, what I call human entropy, going from bad to worse. You just put a lot of humans together, don't uh, add in Jesus, and they will always get worse. Always. Human entropy just happens because of our sin nature. But we have been set free from human entropy. We've been born again from incorruptible seed. We've been set free from the corruption. So we have an even greater responsibility with our freedom because some of the world, they're just, they're just bound in their sin nature. We've been set free of that. We can do more with our freedom, which is why Paul suggests something we should do with our freedom in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. He says this. He says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. You've been called to freedom. You think the world is free. Man, we're really free. You think you can do anything you want. I can do stuff. I cannot do stuff I want. How's that for a choice? Right? So, you brethren have been called to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. We have just as much right as the world to use our opportunity for bad stuff. Right? Just we have to give an account. Paul says, don't do it. Don't use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. He says, you've been set free. Now, here's what I encourage you to do with that freedom. Rather than spend it on yourself, choose to love and serve others with it. That's the recommendation that Paul makes, right? So, if we do that, if we intentionally decide to love, understand that it's going to, because of the war that I talked about, it's going to include suffering for others, and it's going to include uh, resisting our flesh, all right? And here's what that looks like. Here's a very simple example. Um, I'm trying to love you, and you, uh, and I'm choosing to spend my liberty loving you instead of being evil, right? And you decide that's annoying because you think I'm constraining your freedoms in some way, and you decide to yell at me, all right? And in response to your yelling, I decide to love you and bless you, which makes you more mad. Now, here's what I'm doing. I am suffering persecution from you for you because I'm hoping you're going to get a revelation of Jesus and how I'm responding. My choosing... To spend my freedom on love guarantees me suffering. And not only that, now I have to resist the flesh because eight things have come to mind that would be really fun to say. (laughs) And I have to resist every single one of them and choose to love you and bless you. Right? Let's be real. Doesn't, you know, you don't just hear angels sing and it all goes out of your head. I'm casting down vain imaginations and taking thoughts captive and, you know, right? So I want you to see this choice to take our freedom and spend it on loving others is a choice to suffer for others and it sets us up for a war with our flesh, to suffer in the flesh, to have to resist our flesh. But Paul recommends it that we do it. Amen? Amen? And so then in verse 6, he goes, for this reason, because, and he's saying, because all men are accountable, that's the reason, because we're all accountable to God, because we all have to one day give an account to him who will judge the living and the dead. It says, for this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but according to God in the spirit. And what this is, this is just a reference to uh, 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20. Remember, we talked about how Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth and he preached the gospel to captives to those who had died uh, before the flood or really any time before Christ that Abraham's bosom we talked about it if you if you don't understand that you didn't hear 
uh, the second half of 1 Peter chapter 3. Go listen to it. Everyone else, you remember that, right? So he's just referencing that, and he's just saying that those who died before Christ were given the same opportunity. Because we're all accountable to God, they were given that same opportunity to escape judgment in the flesh, to be made alive in the Spirit. Now, just so we're very clear how that works, I want to read uh, John chapter 5, verse 24 to you. Jesus is talking here, and he says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who has sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, Woo-hoo! but is passed from death to life. Bam, just like that, believing Jesus' words and believing the one who sent him. Amen? Now, all I'm saying is, this was true when he went to the lower parts of the earth and preached to them. If they heard his words and believed in him and sent him, they got everlasting life. So they were, as Paul says here, um, they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but they could live according to God in the spirit, just like us. That's all it's saying. Good? All right. Let's jump on to verse 7, my favorite one here coming up. So I just love this. He just so, so he goes, but the end of all things is at hand. I, and it, you know, I think that's the early version of the guy with the thing, the, what do you call it, the sandwich board, where you walk around the corners, the end is near. The early version, the end of all things is at hand. Um, so this is probably where that came from. So if you're going to do that, if you're going to do New York and go walk around the corners, you should actually use the biblical version. The end of all things is at hand would be better. The end of near is shorter, but uh, this is more biblical. Anyway, I just love, that's just fun to say, isn't it? The end of all things is at hand. Now, he said that a couple thousand years ago. But uh, the attitude is uh, a recognition of the corruption that's in the earth and that things are passing away and that uh, the kingdom is eternal. And it, how we position ourselves, whether the end of all things is 2,000 years away or 20 years away or two years away, we can still position ourselves this way, all right? So at some point, we are in the end times, and you could argue that we've been in the end times since uh, Jesus ascended back into heaven. Uh, certainly that's the way the apostles treated it. Um, so here's what I want you to see. He says, the end of all things is at hand, therefore, very important, What do you do when the end of all things is at hand? What do you do in the end times? What's the primary thing? Well, I guess we're fixing to find out. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Be serious and watchful in your prayers. Church, this is such a simple statement. So hard to get the church to do. So hard to get ourselves to do. I have a hard time getting myself to do it sometimes. But it's just true. Please hear me. The primary End time response is prayer. The most important thing we can do when we find ourselves in the end times is pray. It is right here from Peter. The end of all things is at hand. Pray. Be serious and watchful in prayer. Underline that word watchful. There's a couple, uh, you might miss it. It occurs a couple times in another end times passage. In Matthew 24, where Jesus is talking about the end times and what to expect. He ends it in Matthew 24, verse 42, when he starts talking about how he's going to come as a thief in the night, you don't know when, and he says, watch therefore. I submit to you from 1 Peter 4, 7, watch means pray. Be watchful in your prayers. He says, watch therefore. Just the very next chapter where uh, Jesus is giving us parables about how we're supposed to posture our hearts in the end time. One of them is the parable of the ten virgins, five wise, five foolish, and about having your lamp full. And he ends that in verse 13 with, watch therefore, because you don't know when I'm coming. The same way he did in Matthew 24, watch, you don't know when I'm coming. Pray, you don't know when he's coming, but the end of all things is at hand. So be serious in our prayers. So I just want us to see that there's a significant call to prayer so much more as we see the time approaching. And also this, um, there are many ways we can spend our freedom to love others. Prayer is a significant one. Prayer is a way we can spend our freedom to love others. For example, you know, a few Friday nights from now, we'll have my hop where we gather to pray for the county. 
And so you could be sitting at home and someone says, hey, what do you want to do this Friday night? We want to go see a movie? Want to go out to dinner? I don't know if you can see movies anymore. Um, you want to go out to dinner? And you go, yeah, but wait a minute. We absolutely have the freedom to do that. No guilt, no shame. But what if we chose to spend our freedom on others? What if instead we went to this prayer meeting? Or Thursday night, twice a month when we gather here to pray. Ah, we could watch that show we always watch. But what if we taped it and spent our freedom on others? It's just a thought. Amen. Just a thought. In line with Peter saying, the one thing we ought to do in times like this is pray. Okay, moving right along. Verse 8. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. I love this. Laura, you're going to like this. Um, the word fervent, uh, the, the Greek root there, it carries the connotation of stretching. That's why your notes say, have stretching love. Stretching love that covers a multitude of sins. Now, I used to be an athlete. I don't know, you, you probably can't tell, because uh, I grew out of it. But... Uh, <laughs> But once upon a time, uh, I could like, you know, touch my toes. Now I have to, I have to make noises, just put my shoes on. But, um, you know, I could stand my legs straight and put my hands on the ground. Used to run hurdles, had to be loose, stuff like that. Uh, <clears throat> I had to work at that. Uh, we would stretch a lot at the beginning of practice, right? And you got better at it the more you did it. I'm wondering if stretching love is like that. I'm wondering if the more we do it, we find we can stretch it a little farther. And so I love this concept that this stretching love covers sin. And so, you know, uh, you, you're a jerk, and I decide I'm going to love you anyway. And I go, I think I can, I think I can stretch my love over your sin. And, and you go, all right, well, I'm, I'm going to punch you too. And I go, well, phew, all right, I'm going to try and stretch my love over that. I didn't make it that time. I'm going to go home and stretch some more. Maybe next time I'll be able to get that one. I just love that picture. Stretching love. Fervent love. Stretching love that covers sins. How far can we stretch our love? Guys, we are wealthy in love. Jesus has made us billionaires in love. We can afford to really stretch it if we want to. Amen? Anyway. Uh, so what he does for the rest of this passage, he talks about us basically, above all, the primary end time heart position is to love others, to stretch our love, to cover their sin. And then he gives us some practical ways. Verse 9, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. I love that qualifier there, right? Dang it, I had it until he said without grumbling. Grumbling's the fun part, isn't it? Maybe it's just me. All right. Anyway, uh, the, the Greek there is talking about befriending strangers. Uh, and and uh, it's interesting, in Matthew 25, again, end time passage, he talks about when he comes and he separates people. He does it on the basis of this. And if you remember this, he goes, uh, all these activities, you, you fed me and you clothed me. And when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. You visited me in prison. Or you didn't do these things. And he makes that statement, as many, whatever you've done or not done to the least of these you've done to me. One of the things in that list is I was a stranger and you took me in. And so it apparently is important to him. Now, I don't know today, uh, taking people in isn't probably as commonly needful as it was then. Um, and sometimes it's not even wise. But uh, certainly we can take them into our hearts. We can befriend strangers. And so this is an exhortation to befriend strangers, and to do it without grumbling, which suggests that we might be befriending annoying strangers <laughs> that might cause us to complain, right? Even ones that would make you grumble, befriend them too. Verse 10, uh, where am I? As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So again, each one has received a gift. Everybody here has received a gift. If you don't know what that is, you should really be bugging God about that. God, what, how have you gifted me that I'm supposed to serve others? And we'll help you. We'll pray for you. But the Bible says you got one if you know Jesus. So you're to use your unique gift from God to serve others. It wasn't given to you for you. 
it was given to you for me and for all these guys. Right? And so you use it to serve others. And it says you are a steward of his grace. I get, just like God gave you money and said, here's some money. I want you to spend it to serve others. Uh, it would be wrong for you just to take that and buy yourself a new iPad or something. Right? So he's saying, I've given you grace, but you're just a steward of that grace. I want you to exercise stewardship over it and spending it on others. Use your gifts some to help others. That's what the church does, right? That's how we love. That's how we stretch our love. We use our gift to serve others. And then verse 11, finally, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. Then in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. So he's saying first, speak. speaking is a big deal. It really is a big deal. He's saying, if you're going to speak, make sure you're doing it in line with God's word and God's heart. Make sure you're speaking. God says, if you're going to speak, speak like you're speaking from God, like you're an oracle from God. Now, just to be fair, I haven't always done that. Sometimes I just speak from Tony. It doesn't sound like God, <laughs> right? So the exhortation is here to so adapt so have Christ formed in us, so get God's heart that we begin to speak from his heart like him. We talked about that before. We talked about Matthew 12, uh, 34 through 37. It says, but for every other word we speak, we will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by our words we'll be justified and our words will be condemned. Why? Because in verse 34 it says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So the mouth is a revelation of our heart. So if we can get our heart conformed to Christ, our mouth will do better. And so he's saying, speak from the heart of Christ. Let, uh, have this moral intention of even choosing to love, even accepting suffering. Let it refine your heart so that you can speak like God. And then uh, he says, um, serve by God's empowerment. He says, uh, uh, anyone ministers, let them do it as with the ability which God supplies. So he's just reminding us it's important that we serve by his empowerment, not just in our own strength. We rely on his grace. Grace just means empowerment. And so it's just a reminder to serve by his empowerment. And then finally, the last reminder to do all for his glory, that in all things he would be glorified. Or rather, just a reminder that in all things, we're representing the Father. So when people are being nice to us, we're representing the Father. When we're suffering, we're representing the Father. Whatever we're doing, we're representing the Father. People are looking at us and hopefully getting a revelation of Jesus. Going back to that, that key thing. Anytime they can get a revelation of Jesus, uh, that revelation, uh, the gates of hell can't stand against it. It might be a, a, a binding or a loosing that sets them free. Amen? So at the end of the day, uh, we're stretching our love so that people can have a revelation of Jesus. Does this make sense? All right. Do you feel like, I, I want to blame Peter for this. Do you feel like Peter has sufficiently made us uncomfortable? <laughs> Excellent. All right, Pastor Gary. Amen. Wow. I uh, feel like I've been hit with a stun gun. <laughs> um, there were so many things that, to comment on, but I just want to highlight a couple of things. Uh, we have to make an intentional decision to break away from the mindset of this culture to embrace the mindset of the kingdom of God. And that is an intentional decision. Uh, the spiritual reality is, as it talks about in Colossians 1.13, we've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. So in reality, I, my, my, my perspective should be the kingdom of God. I'm in the kingdom of God. I've been placed in the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of darkness has, no longer has control over my life. Amen? Amen. And the, the other thing is this. God's given us the freedom to choose. We get the freedom to choose how we're going to live our lives. We get the freedom to choose what thoughts we're going to allow to bang around in our mind. We get the freedom to choose what affections we're going to embrace. But in the end, 
with that freedom, we will stand accountable before God with how we responded to it. Amen?